and so I give you the Honorable Cynthia McKinney. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> strong, strong women aren't supposed to cry. But um, I tell you, I get, um, I've been so moved by um, these travails of mine over the past few years. Um, it was actually Zul's idea to call this event Revolutionary Love. And um, I latched onto it and grabbed onto it because rarely in politics do we hear folks talk about love. And it really is the one thing that we need now more than anything else. We need love. We need public people who are not afraid to show themselves as the human beings that they are with all of their frailties, with their imperfections, with whatever warts it is that we have. But the one thing that we have more than anything else is that we love people. We love our country. We expect more from our country and we're willing to act on that expectation. So I have to say thank you to, uh, first of all, St. Mary's for allowing us to be here. I have to say thank you to Zul and Lynn and Pat Levasseur and Don DeBar and all of the people who are part of the organizing committee and most importantly, I have to say thank you to you guys because if you weren't here, we wouldn't even have an event. Um, and yes, the event is about, you know, helping me retire my debt. That's about 2006. But I know many of you are here because um, you want to know about 2008. <laughs> got into politics was because I expected more from my country. I read the history of my country, the domestic politics, the foreign politics, and I became a mother. And as a mother, I wanted the most opportunity possible for my son. But I had a son, young, black, and male. I wanted him to have role models that were stand-up kind of people who had values and ideals. Not like Clarence Thomas. <laughs> I wanted my son to understand that it was all right to be black and proud and strong and stand up. But when I surveyed the political landscape, I didn't see that for my son. Single mom, divorced. Um, so I got involved in politics, and then I started asking all these pesky questions. <laughs> so I got involved in the whole COINTELPRO issue, counterintelligence program, because I wanted to know how come it was so difficult for people like me to get elected, stay elected, have enough money in the campaign coffers, get positive press from the corporate media, and why it was so easy for the folks who sold us out 
didn't do anything for the community, didn't have any values, didn't have anything that they would actually stand up for, and they got everything positive. They had money flowing out of their coffers. They got the positive press, and they got realistic without opposition every time. So I started reading, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I read. Now, I started out in the Georgia legislature. And at the time, the big issue was, were we going to have the Confederate flag on our state flag? Can you imagine in the late 1980s, we're talking about the Confederate flag in Georgia? And so I'm sworn in as a freshman member of the Georgia legislature. And my daddy and all these other people, my dad is telling me, you know, don't be like me. Don't rock the boat. Go along to get along. And then I surveyed the landscape of who it was that I was expected to go along and get along with. These were the people who in 1956, after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, decided to put the stars and bars of the Confederacy on our state flag. And these were supposed to be my heroes. <laughs> so I um, decided I would write a little paper. And the subject matter of the paper was, are you a racist now? So I went to all of the people who voted to put the stars and bars of the Confederacy on Georgia's state flag, and I asked them, are you a racist now? <laughs> that wasn't exactly the smartest thing to do. <laughs> well, I wrote the paper, and eventually the stars and bars of the St. Andrew's Cross came off of Georgia's state flag, but the flag that we have today is still a Confederate flag. And we're still fighting in the South. We're still fighting the wars of the Confederacy right now, today. The issue in South Carolina and Alabama is where the place is for the Confederate flag, for our Confederate heritage. And now I know people in the North and people on the West Coast don't understand the politics of the South. But I love the South. I understand the politics of the South. And yes, I understand my white brothers and sisters who would not dare to even shake my hand when I was running for Congress. But I understand all of that, and that's what I, a part of what I want to make better. But anyway, so I get sworn in into the Georgia legislature, and then um, George Herbert Walker Bush decides that he wants to go to war in Iraq and drop the bombs on Baghdad. Now, with the studies that I have done in international relations, I viewed this as just one more intervention by our country into the affairs of another country of color that uh, we had no business trying to dictate to. So on a point of personal privilege, I went to the floor of the House, the Georgia legislature, and um, I said, among other things, George Bush ought to be ashamed of himself. Well, at that point, things got a little rough. All of my colleagues got up and walked out on me. And I was compared to Julian Bond, not a bad comparison, but that was bad for them. I was compared to Julian Bond, and my patriotism was questioned. In fact, they changed the rules in the Georgia legislature so that we had to say the Pledge of Allegiance every day, and instead of looking at the flag, everybody turned and looked at me <laughs> to make sure I was saying all of the words and saying them correctly. It wasn't an easy four years in the Georgia legislature, but then uh, came redistricting, came the census redistricting, Georgia got new districts, there was a little thing called the Voting Rights Act. And so I decided to work with the ACLU and blacks from across the, the state 
And we came up with a way so that we could actually improve the representation by blacks in, the Georgia, in Georgia's black belt and in Congress. Well, that made the good old boys real mad. <laughs> and um, by the time I was finished with them, we had won in the Department of Justice, and they were ready to send me to Washington, DC. With a one-way ticket, of course. And so I go up to Washington on this campaign of uh, why not a woman? Of all of the people who were running all over the state of Georgia, we didn't have a woman in Congress, and so we said, well, why not a woman? Well, that in and of itself was revolutionary, because I was black, I wore pants, I didn't wear suits, I didn't have the little blue uh, suit with the frilly blouse, I had my hair kind of, you know, and um, it just didn't go. I had all of these highfalutin, well-appointed, well-heeled consultants come down from Washington, D.C. and tell me I had to change. If you want to go to Washington, Cynthia, you got to change. Well, I told them, uh, yeah, I couldn't change. And so the people had a choice. Now, we, through our good work with the Department of Justice, we were able to get these three black districts that the good old boys didn't want but two. And so then the, the good old boys got in the back room and they decided who was going to be the next black representative from Georgia to go to Congress. Well, I didn't like that. And so the Speaker of the House had his candidate. The governor of Georgia, who was Zigzag Zale Miller, had his candidate. And so I decided that the people needed to have their candidate. So under Why Not a Woman, I decided to run. We ran and we won. In 1993, I got sworn in, but then something happened. What happened was the good old boy that I beat decided to file a lawsuit against the district. And so then we had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. I had to defend my presence in Washington, D.C., and I'm not just talking about with the Capitol Hill Police. <laughs> I had to defend my presence in Washington, D.C. every moment that I was there from 1993 until we lost the Supreme Court decision in 1996. And then they put me in a 30% black district and began to write my political obituary. Well, of course, nobody could win who was as black as me in a 30% black district in the state of Georgia. After spending $1.6 million, after all, we did raise it too. And a lot of that money came from folks from New York City. We had people <laughs> who came to Georgia from all over the country. They saw that some, a travesty was in process and they were going to draw a line in the sand and they were not going to allow it to happen. And they didn't allow it to happen. So in 1996, in that watershed election, unfortunately, it now sets a new standard. For those of you who are lawyers or experts in the Voting Rights Act, you know now that it wasn't necessarily such a good thing because we won, but we lowered the threshold for um, drawing black districts now, or black opportunity districts, or minority opportunity districts. It doesn't really too much matter because uh, Clarence Thomas, we lost the Supreme Court decision and Clarence Thomas voted with the majority against those desperately poor rural black belt people in the state of Georgia, some of whom did not even have running water in their homes. They had no representation. It was dire poverty. In fact, one of the first cases that we had was of young black kids who were banned from downtown in one of our little small towns. They couldn't go downtown. And so we did a little march, and the whites were just angry. But by the end of the four years that I represented that district, we were able to bring together the blacks and the whites because what I learned more than anything else about my people in the South 
is that the whites want desperately to change. They don't like the system down there. But nobody is going to step out of line to do the right thing because the penalties are so high. And it, this is a burden, this discrimination, this racism, this hatred is a burden that people have to carry. And if you can unload that from them, then you can really create a community, and that's what we had begun to do. And that was the danger. That's why they said I was dangerous, because we were bringing black people and white people in the rural south of Georgia together. And so the district was dismantled. And then I had to run in an entirely new district. And uh, we uh, managed to win. But everything that I've done, you know, racial politics is there. It's still Georgia. Um, I've done without the luxury of having a whole lot of black people in the districts to vote for me. So when they change the district lines, or they try to do electoral manipulations as they've done, of those of you who have seen American Blackout know about the crossover voting, which you don't have here in New York State. In fact, most of the states of the United States do not have crossover voting. It's something that prevails basically in the South. And what it allows is the recreation of the all-white primary. So white Democrats, white Republicans can join together and trump the choice of black voters who are protected. That choice is protected by the Voting Rights Act. So what I think has happened to me on two occasions is a violation of the Voting Rights Act, but it really doesn't matter when you don't have enforcement. So. Anyway, I began to ask these pesky little questions. And um, one of them, all of my research pertaining to how I could get these role models for my son and why things were just so messed up politically, and I stumbled upon the counterintelligence program. I stumbled upon COINTEL Pro. And then I began to really, really investigate with the might of a congressional office and the background of somebody who loves to read and research. And it became very clear to me that the one thing that the powers that be hate more than anything else is a room that looks like this. Black folks and white folks, people of all political, religious, economic, language persuasions coming together for a common goal and that is to make our country better. That is what they fear more than anything else. And so I began to read these documents, and then I began to understand through my relationship with the King family that everything we know about the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a lie. It's a lie. So I did a thing on political prisoners. I did a thing on um, the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I did a thing on, uh, I introduced legislation on Tupac, similar to the legislation to release all government papers and government files on uh, the life surveillance and murder of Dr. King as well. And clearly, it, I understood that we are as a black community, what we are because of the COINTELPRO operation against black leadership, authentic black leadership in this country. Regime change was nothing new, is nothing new. Regime change, we found documents talking about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. years before he was actually killed. We found documents talking about changing the authentic leadership that blacks had at the time to what they called clean Negroes. Those were Negroes like Clarence Thomas who were more loyal to the system than they were to their own community, to their own country. And so then it became very evident to me that the reason that I don't have role models for my son 
is because the government has allowed this proliferation of clean Negroes who refuse to stand up and take a stand for our community and for our country. Now, the Black Panther Party was targeted, but the Black Panthers weren't the only ones who were targeted. The American, Indi the American Indian Movement was targeted, the Chicano Movement was targeted, the Puerto Rican Independentista Movement was targeted, all progressive whites were targeted, anybody who formed the rainbow of progressive thought in this country was targeted. And horrible, terrible things were done to them. And in fact, we still live today with the repercussions of the things that were done back then. And then, not only were the COINTELPRO documents a revelation to me, but then also a book, uh, I think you've got the DVD here, Everything You Never Wanted to Know About Foreign Policy? Yes, I think Frank Dorrell uh, compiled it. Highly recommend it. Tells the whole history of US intervention all over the world. And one of the things that moved me so much that made me decide to ask for the International Relations Committee when I got elected to Congress was the fact that Henry Kissinger decided that we needed to have regime change in, um, well, first of all, they were protecting the apartheid countries in Southern Africa. And they chose um, Holden Roberto, FNLA, over MPLA. Holden Roberto was the brother-in-law of Mobutu. So what they did was they used this nascent black pride that they had helped to destroy, kind of, and they sent black people to Angola and in, South, in Southern Africa to fight on the wrong side. And I said, there is absolutely no way that if I decide to run for Congress and if I go to Congress that I am not going to be a part of some change for my country. So I asked to serve on the House International Relations Committee, and there, man, go, oh boy, I got into so much trouble. <laughs> well, it was all right, you know, it was all right, but then, at the same time, we have, we have a militarization of our lives at home and abroad, and Ron Dellums and Pat Schroeder had decided that they were going to leave Congress and they wanted a progressive voice on the House Armed Services Committee too. They were forced for one year to sit in one chair because the Dixiecrat Bo Weevil chairperson of the House Armed Services Committee at the time when they were elected didn't like the idea of a woman and of a black man making U.S. military policy. So he refused to give them chairs, and they had to share a seat. But the two of them got together and decided when they left Congress, they were going to share that seat, pass their torch to me. So I had the great privilege of serving on both the International Relations Committee and the Armed Services Committee. Now, if I were Sam Nunn or some other folks like that, some would say that then, you know, maybe you're an expert. So when you, aside from the fact that, you know, I had studied at undergrad, grad, and was working on my PhD, didn't matter, didn't matter, can never be an expert in these matters if you're really going to try and be for the people. People here, people abroad. And so um, eventually when I asked the question about September 11th, I was called loony. Um, I was called other names. 
But I was never called reasoned, rational, scholarly, academic, learned, well-read. Those are not the characterizations that are normally given to black women. And I look at my two young sisters here because I want them to understand that what is out there and what they say you are, you are not. And you have to be strong enough. So at any rate, then, um, you know, after September 11th, after the Iraq War, um, all of this stuff, 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 I get kicked out of Congress, and um, the, the national progressive community says, well, you know, you got to run again. And that was a very difficult decision because my mother had had to suffer through all of this media stuff, and she didn't like what she was reading. She knew it wasn't true. And uh, so uh, anyway, I decided against her wishes to run again. So I ran again. And when I ran again, it was almost as if I was punished for winning. In January, um, well, if you go back, you can look and see that I've had these problems with Capitol Hill police ever since I was sworn in in 1993. But in January of 2006, things just really, uh, you know, I did the, in 2005, I did the 911 hearing. And um, then, of course, uh, the Democratic leadership had told the Democratic caucus to stay away from the issue of Katrina. I defied them and participated on Katrina. Yeah. We were told to stay away from the anti-war protests. I participated in every anti-war protest in Washington, D.C. So January 2006 rolls around, and um, I get stopped by the police. Now, we have a little pin, kind of like this. Doesn't have your name, doesn't have your photograph, doesn't have nothing on it. I didn't happen to have mine on that day. I mean, but you know, most members of Congress, if you look at them on C-SPAN, you'll see they don't wear the pins. And this right here, I mean, not this one, but the pen, a facsimile is available for purchase by the public at the house bookstore. <laughs> members of Congress are supposed to be protected by the Capitol Hill police. Capitol Hill police can't protect you if they don't know what you look like. So they are required to know every member of Congress by face. The 16-year-old pages in the House of Representatives are required to know every member of Congress by face. So January comes around after I've done all of these things, and um, I get stopped by the police. The uh, I do my normal thing. I get stopped. I complain. I get an apology. And in January, they held a special class and they told the members of the Capitol Hill Police, they showed them my picture and told them to know who I am. So February rolls around and I get stopped again. And in February, they posted my photograph at all of the checkpoints. So March rolls around and I get stopped again, but this time this guy touches me. Now, I'm only going to my work. I'm not drunk. I ain't driving. I have my bags in my hand. I'm trying to take care of the people's business. If I were actually a threat, the police officer failed miserably in his responsibility to protect the members of Congress because I was already down the hall and around the corner when he decided to run after me 
and stop me. Well, at any rate, if I do something in 2008, uh, they tried to label me as um, the violent congresswoman. <laughs> but honestly, they ain't seen violence yet. What I would like to do is violence to the system. Yes. Violence to the oppression. This wonderful, beautiful poem about what happened at Hurricane Katrina unveiled the verities of life for some people in the United States, for the whole world to see. The young brother here lost his son could have been my son, could have been your son, to police violence. And they want to talk to us about violence. We are in desperate need of structural change in this country. We cannot tolerate, and I'm about to stop, but we cannot tolerate War as an energy policy. Consumption as an economic policy. We cannot tolerate what is happening now. And I would just close by reminding you, I have a Haitian American with me. What have the Haitian people endured The United States government, with your money and my money, stole their president in the middle of the night, took him to another country, destination unknown. He did not know where he was going. And then in the process, they tried, after all of this had been done, they tried to steal the election so that the Haitian people couldn't have their next president, Rene Preval. But the Haitian people, and there's always a comma behind Haiti, the hemisphere's poorest country, the Haitian people didn't accept election theft. The Haitian people took to the streets and demanded that their choice be respected. And that's how we have Rene Preval as the president of Haiti today. Now, if the people of Haiti can do that, what the heck is wrong with us? I've had the privilege and the opportunity to do a whole lot of traveling since I have been out of Congress. I've been to Asia, I've been to Latin America, haven't been to Africa yet, but I've been to Europe. And everywhere the world is waiting on us. And you see that poster there? The world can't wait for us any longer. And the world did not wait because starting in Cuba, but then in Venezuela and Chile and Argentina and Bolivia and Brazil, they did not wait for us. So if I do something in 2008, and I really do want to do something in 2008, it will be the fullest expression that I know of revolutionary love. Because we will make revolution, and it will only be about love. Thank you very much.
I can't hardly wait for 2008. Uh, Ms. McKinney, Ms. McKinney, in 2008, what color is your parachute? <laughs> you guys are a tough crowd, you know, because I don't know what time it is, but I know it's very late. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, this has been wonderful. It has been about love. It has been revolutionary. Um, Y'all have also helped me make a little dent in um, next month's uh, bills that have to be paid for the 2006 campaign, but I can tell you that um, we're well on our way with the well wishes that I've received from all of you for um, what we have in store for 2008. Let me close by saying um, that uh, to be in the same room, on the same stage, or rather kind of pulpit, um, at the same event with a woman I've read about in the newspaper and admired from afar, and I'm talking about you, Lynn. I mean, it's like, how many high points in your life can you get? Um, true heroes, or true heroine. Um, thank you, Lynn, because I know it's not easy. And whoever that was that said early on that, you know, your friends walk away from you, thank you very much because you've been more than a friend to me. And um, I hope that I can reciprocate the kind of love and support that you've shown to me because it's truly extraordinary. Thank you very much. Thank you all.